Good afternoon, good afternoon. I think we're still waiting for everybody to get in on here. It looks like everybody is in. Welcome to the September 10th edition of Chat with Green Aggies. Um, you're here talking to a bunch of uh, folks working in extension for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. My name is Kevin Ong and uh, uh, we'll have a go around and uh, introduce everyone and we'll end up with a uh, Dr. Mamangu, who will actually have more announcements to have. So go ahead, Erfan. Hey, my name is Erfan with Texas a and AgriLife Extension, obviously uh, based out of Tyler and I deal mainly with uh, insects in uh, nursery and ornamental production. So Becky. Hi, I'm Dr. Becky Bowling. I recently relocated to DFW where I am serving as a statewide extension specialist for urban water. I also have a strong turf background. So I talk a lot about that on here. Yeah, I, I did forget to mention I'm the plant disease guy. I like to see plants die most of the time. Let's go to some of our illustrious uh, caddy agents. Uh, Laura. Hey, I'm Laura Miller here in Tarrant County, downtown Fort Worth, which you can see in the background today. Um, and a um, commercial horticulture agent. And to another part of the state, Paul. Thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Winsky with uh, actually Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. I am a county extension agent, uh, commercial horticulture, and I'm in Harris County. So I'm in the Houston area. So just to remind everybody, this is a uh, session that, that we uh, kind of get around and talk about things and share stuff uh, as a, uh, an opportunity to uh, get some information out there to those of you that are in industry. So off to Dr. Mamangu, who actually got all this started, and I, I believe she has some news for you guys. Well, thank you, Dr. Ong. We started this uh, back uh, in April, and I just want to tell you that I put in a link. I put in a link in the chat. So, so far, uh, we have been doing this every week. So, so far, we have had 19, guys, 19. Uh, we've been doing this for 19 weeks, no, 20 weeks, actually, because oh. we have had a third Thursday. We have Chitty Chat Thursday. That's when we don't have a recording. But all the others, we have a recording. We have 19 videos on the, uh, on the uh, list, on the YouTube playlist that I just posted in the chat. So uh, if you missed any of those, any of our uh, previous chat, please go to the uh, playlist. And it has, you know, in each week um, in the introduction, we have, uh, you know, in, uh, we have a content, you know, what we talked about in that specific week. So you could go back to, go to the playlist and, and uh, check on those things. And, uh, and for instance, uh, there is another uh, purpose of this, this, uh, this playlist. If you want to see, uh, hmm, you know, maybe in April, what may happen in my landscape or in production, go back to our, uh, go back to our uh, 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 chat in April and see what's going on, what we were talking about in April 2020, because what we're talking about in April 2020 might happen again in uh, April 2021. So, um, so, so, so please, uh, you know, utilize this, this very valuable resource. And as you can see that all of us uh, in AgriLife Extension with different expertise and also our uh, industry partner, uh, you know, uh, Carlos Bogron, who used to be, who used to be uh, part of uh, AgriLife Extension. So, you know, all these uh, very, uh, 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 inf a lot of information. Uh, we created these informations for you specifically, you know, with folks in the uh, in green industry, either in, you know, if you're in production in landscape or in uh, uh, in consultant, you know, if you're a consultant. So we hope these uh, information will be valuable for you. And if you have any um, specific questions or, uh, or the topics that you would like us to cover, Please, uh, you know, just um, either sh either share your uh, uh, topics or issues in our Facebook page, or just email it to one of us, and and we'll hopefully, you know, address it in our future uh, chat with Green Aggies. That's all for me. Thank you. So thanks, Dr. Gu, for starting all this back when and roping us into this. Well, I think we got a bunch of stuff uh, uh, to share with you guys today, and. Uh, 
just to give you the rundown, we have Erfan talking about moth. We have Laura talking about funky Chinese pistache. And you do want to stick around uh, for the plant of the week. And Paul is going to share with you one of the cool plants uh, uh, that he's going to uh, highlight this week. So uh, let's get started. Erfan, you hey. have the microphone. Thank you so much. And when you say the, the funky Chinese pistache, there's going to be some great music, hopefully, to accompany that. Is that right, Laura? This. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it. All right. Well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, European pepper moth because it seems like a lot of growers are starting to see a little bit more, uh, whether it be in production or also in the landscape. And this is an invasive uh, moth, also known as the Duponcellia fovialis or Duponcellia moth. Uh, and it was basically first introduced uh, and seen in basically two instances before it really established in San Diego County in California. And the larvae, they feed in the leaves and they can girdle uh, the, the plant base, like the stem at that bottom. And that causes kind of parts of the plant to essentially die off. So here's what the larva looks like. And here's what the adult looks like. The diameter is almost a little less than a penny. So they're pretty small and they are nocturnal flyers. So unless uh, you're really looking for them, they can be pretty hard to see. And really the, the only, the main signs of them are the types of symptoms that they can cause. They have a very wide host range, which also makes them very problematic, especially in our you know, warmer part of the world, our warmer part of the US, where they can continue to reproduce throughout the, the entire year, especially in greenhouse settings. So, um, you know, amaranthus, we got beets, uh, pepper, chrysanthemum, poinsettia, uh, cucumbers, coleus. Right now we're seeing them quite a bit on mums. Um, and in some instances also getting on poinsettias as well. So this is where um, it's, it's often kind of brought up is because it's kind of later in the season. So their, their population has a chance to really um, grow and expand by this time and they can, their damage can be most noticeable. Uh, we also have things like impatiens, uh, lettuce, gerberas, uh, geraniums. We have pizza. So very few people know that pizza is actually a vegetable that grows on trees, which is uh, makes it totally acceptable to consume on a daily basis. And do punch uh, yeah. uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Are you uh, posting this on Facebook? It was not going. Uh, unfortunately, we're having going. some technical technical difficulties. That's while Kevin and you were talking, I was trying to work that in the background, but it, okay. it uh, did right. not Sorry. go. Yeah, Sorry to interrupt. No, Thank you're you. fine. Um, we also got uh, rose, uh, blackberry, and tomato. So a whole lot of different plant hosts. And this is an example of what the symptoms can look like, right? So you got this mum, it looks like it's growing just fine. All of a sudden, a portion of it or one of the stems all of a sudden uh, starts to die back and desiccate. And so when we take a closer look, we can see in here some of these uh, dark spots here are the frass. It's the actual poop of the caterpillar. Right here, this part of the stem that kind of looks like it, there's a chunk kind of missing of the outer tissue is most likely the chewing damage from the Duponcellia moth. In this case, in mums, we don't find them in the stem or in the fruit, as, as with some others we'll see here in a bit. But they will be at the base of the plant chewing away or girdling that, that lower stem. And you can see some webbing here at the bottom as well. So these are very fine webs that can also be caused by the caterpillar. The caterpillar by itself um, is relatively cryptic. It, it's really good at hiding. Uh, and so in my experience, it's been pretty hard to find as compared to the symptoms of its damage. Here are some other examples. So you can see this uh, thick webbing. You can actually see the caterpillar right there and all these black spots that are its frass. Over here on the right side as well, you can see very high density of frass. It's another term for poop um, that's, that's kind of populating this area. And so uh, when we look at a greenhouse like this, right, this is an example of um, some mums that would appear to be highly damaged by Duponcellia pepper moth. Uh, because you can see this very uneven growth or segments of the mums that are uh, quite damaged. What's very interesting, uh, so there's, we're still, there's still a lot to, to learn about this particular moth. Uh, what was interesting is when I scouted this uh, particular house, maybe about 50% of these mums had signs of Duponcellia moth uh, presence or damage, right? You'd think it'd be a little bit higher because of uh, just, just the... Um, just the extent of which you can see um, kind of this, this dieback or uneven canopy growth. When you go into this greenhouse, you'll see very nice kind of flush and, and pretty even growth 
Uh, and yet 100% of these plants had signs of Dupont Chelly moth. When I say signs of it, looking under that canopy, finding webbing and frass. And one of the, the possible reasons that we need to investigate is, you know, you'll notice one major difference between these two. There may be others, obviously, but one is this one's on drip irrigation and this one is uh, overhead watered. And it's possible that the combination of water stress and the Duponchelia moth uh, causes major, major damage. Whereas if you can keep water stress at a minimum, perhaps you can subvert some of the, the, the symptoms or signs of Duponchelia moth damage. So that's something um, that, that we need to kind of look into. Maybe there's a way of, even if you have it, to still make the plant look fabulous. Um, here again, some more pictures of that webbing and the frass that you can see and some of the chewing damage, again, the moth with this distinct uh, white and brown banding uh, on its body. And the wings are predominantly brown with this uh, white band that's uh, relatively characteristic of this particular moth. And here's the caterpillar uh, again on, on some of that. They lay their eggs in clusters. The female can lay about 200 eggs in her lifetime and they spend between four to nine days as eggs. So depending on temperature and our warmer seasons can be shorter. Whoop. <clears throat> They spend three to four weeks as larvae where they'll burrow into those stems and fruits. So usually if they're burrowing, it's usually in the fruit. Uh, stems, they'll often feed on the outside or, or girdle like we saw earlier. Then they'll pupate, they'll form like a cocoon for one to two weeks and out comes a new adult moth. So again, distinct features of, is this white banding on the body, brown with white banding and this uh, band along the wing. They're good flyers, so they can fly about 60 miles uh, per adult. Uh, they can also disperse to propagative and non-propagative material, so we could be spreading them ourselves. Um, and so a single generation, so from egg to adult, to potentially new reproducing adult is six to eight weeks, depending on where. So you can have between eight to nine generations per year recorded in some greenhouses again. So if we have a warmer uh, climate sustained, uh, both outdoors and within greenhouses, uh, we can have more generations. And that's why I think we're seeing uh, a lot of that damage later in the season, these late season crops like mums and poinsettias, uh, is because they've had a chance to build up their populations eight or nine generations. They haven't shown to overwinter uh, very well. And so in terms of where they've been detected, I mean, they've been detected in Texas since 2011. And so uh, they're a continual uh, problem. And there are some uh, traps or lures that can be used for them that, that may be... Um, that may be something to consider if you regularly battle Dupont Shelly at Pepper Moth. They're not cheap. So four lures uh, is $120. So these are pheromones. So they're very specific to catching male moths. And it can give you a very early uh, idea of when those male moths are looking for females to mate and the females are laying eggs, which is basically when you want to time some of your applications, uh, any pesticidal applications that you may want to uh, make. And there are two main types of traps that are often used with those lures. One is just a delta, oops, sorry, delta sticky trap. So it's a sticky trap that's in the shape of the Greek letter uh, delta, um, which is said to be a little bit messy and, and more difficult to work with compared to these water traps. Uh, so you can see this is just like a cover. The pheromone goes up there. And in here you can have uh, water with a few drops of uh, soap. So essentially the males are attracted in there, fall in that water and they drown. And so it's just a lot easier to work with uh, than those sticky Delta, Delta cards. In terms of management right now for larval control, their uh, BT is said to have some good efficacy. There's rove beetle as a biological control, so as a potential predator has been used. I, I don't know of any studies where it has been used in, say, our warmer climates, so I cannot attest to its efficacy uh, in our regions. And beneficial nematodes as well. So these are uh, insect parasitic nematodes. So they will infect the insect and uh, kill them in the, in, the, in the soil, especially. For the egg stage, predatory mites, again, rove beetles and some parasitic wasps that may work. In terms of some cultural control, we may consider things like remove weeds from growing areas, any of those potential alternate hosts. You want to remove any pet plants, leftover stock material that's infested, bag it and get it out of there. It needs to be removed and contained to prevent that uh, life cycle from completing and getting more generations. 
keep the growing area clean, uh, remove lower leaves and use drier growth medium. So they do need kind of a more, a little bit of a humid environment. And when we have those lower leaves that are there, if they are not necessary, if they, if it can be pruned back a bit to uh, allow for some better airflow, it's going to be, it's going to be helpful as well as allow for pesticide uh, penetration. So we'll see here in a moment, some, some insecticides that can be used, but they require uh, getting down there into the base of the plant. So when we're talking insecticidal control, um, for adults, there are not a whole lot of things that have been studied, uh, whether they are effective. Really, orthene as an aerosol or fog at nighttime is basically the, the only thing that's been demonstrated to, to work at this time. Just a lot of other things have not yet been tested. Uh, and so since they are night flyers, you know, the idea is that if you want to get those adults, you have to get them when they are flying and uh, you're doing an aerosol or a fog. So you're, you're uh, filling that space. So you're actually contacting them. For the larvae, there's a few different insecticides that have demonstrated efficacy, Overture, Tame, Tostar, Orthene, BT, and Safari. Um, however, like I mentioned, one of the most important things is that penetration, actually getting down into that canopy, which for mums is gonna be one of the greatest challenges because it does have such a thick canopy. So we, uh, we're looking at, you know, it's very important for us to know uh, how important of a problem is this. So if as a grower or a, a landscaper, you have noticed this particular insect uh, or you've dealt with it quite a bit, bit, please let me know. We're trying to get an idea of the economic impact of this pest so that we can apply for some funding to do research on how to better monitor it or manage it uh, within our region. So please uh, reach out to me with, with that. Uh, and with that, I'm going to, yeah, let's take it to Laura uh, to talk about some, some funk in the Chinese pistache. They're fun. Before I, we start talking about this little problem, um, yeah. uh, Robbie had a question about, which, which occurred to me too, um, is part of the life cycle of this pest in the uh, soil? You know, you mentioned the beneficial nematodes. Yeah, so um, as I understand it, the larvae, um, the, the caterpillars can spend some time in, in and or around that soil. So they're basically at the, at the base of the stem. So right. they're basically at the soil level. Then the, uh, the pupil stage is also down either in the soil or right down at that level as well. So gotcha. there are a number of stages that are, um, all the immature stages are close to the soil, if not in the soil. Also, as a person who was out looking at moms this week, um, I think removing lower leaves would be impossible. I mean, there's like so <laughs> many leaves. On and moms, really dense yes. And, yeah, yeah. You know, moms, I just, yes. I can't. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but some of those other plant hosts, I mean, I'm not, I'm not okay. sure if, if there are some other plant hosts that removing those lower leaves may be practical. Okay, okay. Because I was like, how would you do that? Yeah, not huh. mums. Yeah, I don't know how. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Agreed. So, Arifon, you, you did say that they're part of the life cycle is, gonna, is in the soil, right? Is that the soil level? You know, I'm not exactly sure if they so will dwell within the soil for a good portion of their lives, but I know as, as, as the caterpillars and pupa, they are very close to, if not sometimes right, right in that soil level. So what, uh, what, what soil, what the nematode work in, you know, in certain way to control that part of the, the life stage? Yeah, so I think that's where there's been at least one study that looked at the use of uh, insect parasitic nematodes and mm -hmm. demonstrated some level of efficacy. Yeah. Is it in Texas yet? Uh, the, yes. the, the, the nematodes? Yeah, yeah yes. No, both, the, both things are. Yes. Yeah, the DuPont, moth. yeah, the, the oh. moth is, yeah, it has been uh, for several years now. For several years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I also wanted to say I did check in with uh, Sean Steed in, in Florida, my, uh, my friend there in my old job, and he said that they were not having a problem with them this year um, in mm. moms, to the best of his knowledge. So oh, interesting. That was, that was interesting to me. Yeah, it seems, I mean, it'd be really interesting to know what makes their populations or their damage so variable, perhaps year after year. You know, I know some growers that they have them almost every year and other growers that it's more of a problem some years than others. And I wonder if that goes back to, you know, it might be the combination of plant stress and having the DuPont chili pepper moth where you start to see the symptoms. And so if you have a year where your plants are not too stressed, environmental conditions are perhaps a little bit more optimal, 
then maybe one could easily be under the impression that they did not have that moth at all. Um, so yeah, it'd be kind of interesting to see. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I think that price of that pheromone needs to come down a little bit so, so people could do some more. You know, right. Well, I, I wonder if it's because it's a you know relatively new exotic invasive. Yeah. Uh, the demand for the pheromone might be relatively low, so right. um, I, I don't know. I don't know what goes into the pricing of those things. So that would be easier than looking for them. Really. Yeah, absolutely. Now pheromones can usually last a good while. You know, yeah. so three to six months, if not a bit longer. And so when you're looking at four of them for that much, um, it may be worth it if you're looking at, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of <laughs> economic damage, yeah. uh, particular pests. Sure. sure. Okay. Well, here's these beautiful pictures of this very attractive Chinese pistache here. Um, I know y'all are enjoying looking at this. Um, it is a mystery to me as to what is going on with this. The, the, Landscaper who contacted me did not install this material that was fairly recently installed within the last year. And um, he's in maintaining it clearly and wondering what the heck is going on. I haven't actually been able to go to this site uh, since it's not really handy to my office, but um, these are the photos he sent me and I just want to throw this out there and say, y'all, what do you think? So it, it, it is fairly recently installed. You can see on the, on the right, the kind of back at it picture there. Um, in the middle, some really close up, weird looking leaves and then also weird looking leaves on the left. So what do y'all think? I, if, if I'm, Sometimes mites do that. I mean, yeah, I don't know if there are. I mean, I was trying to see if there's aerified mites on Chinese pistachio. On Chinese pistachio, I, I couldn't really find a lot of information about pests of Chinese pistachio. You know, um, if any of y'all have any knowledge. I'd... So, so Laura, uh... how long ago was this? How long ago was the? The, the plant installed, the, the question, what, I mean, I'm not. Yeah, I, that, I, that too. And uh, how, uh, when was this picture sent to you? It was sent to me a few weeks ago. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's not, it's not brand new, fresh. Um, okay. So, and before, uh, actually, you know, it wasn't, I, and this is irrigated, even though it's kind of like that low, in, low water use landscape it is irrigated and he had checked to make sure the irrigation was okay but was everything installed around the same time Laura like these like the, the grasses and everything else the yuccas to the best of my knowledge yes but as I said the person who contacted me did not actually do the installation just so there's some pieces of information missing there yeah yeah so real quick too, from the pictures, you can't really tell, but it seems like those little leaf symptoms, it's not occurring on the whole plant. There are some leaves that are coming out normally. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't call that normal. <laughs> it's well, it's, it's, yeah. it's still a little funky. Yeah, it's pretty funky. Yeah. Uh, Robbie asked Here whether this is, a, this is a ball and burlap or it was a container. I, I do not know that either. I do not know that either. Lots well, of interesting information. This is, this is the uh, exciting part about the landscape CSI. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. I thought this is, this is the landscape CSI right here. Mm, I don't so know. when was this installed, by the way, do you know? Or it's been within the last years? year. Within, within the, the last, last year. year, okay. Yeah. So, so we got a couple of plants on campus, crab myrtle, which uh -huh. will show similar symptoms like this. Um, on campus, but then if you wait a couple of weeks, then the, the leaves start to become a little bit more normal. It just so happened that those two crib myrtles were planted along a gas line. Ooh. So that's one of the things to do is, you know, with something like this, if you got a good microscope, look for aerified mites. If there's none and there's no other indication which would suggest chemical drift or something, 
Yeah, and, and and then the next simplest thing would be to do a salt test to see if it might be zinc deficiency or something like that. And if there's no explanation for that, and you look around in a landscape like this, especially when there's no other trees, or even if there's a row of trees and you got one or two trees that are adjacent to each other, you gotta figure out what's at the bottom. Now, I would not be also surprised because I've seen a, oh, a pecan tree that was grown in a, I think in Garland or something, um, and it was, I think, two or three years in, they started having similar type symptoms and just so happened was those plants were planted over the top of where the trash pile was from the uh, mm. uh, construction. So, so this is one of those, if there's no aerophyte mice, there's no uh, good indication of chemical drift and there's no out of whack in, in, in soil chemistry. What's running under there by the roots? Yeah. That's, that's a question to ask. I like that theory a lot because this is a new construction area and you know new installation and everything. That, that does make a lot of sense. Becky, did you have something? I just was going to point out that, that I don't know what else is around this, but this is the only dicot in these plants here, right? Because the Hesperellas are right. monocots, the right. grass is monocot. So it could still be herbicide injury that you're just not seeing. If it is like a, a, a broadleaf herbicide, you wouldn't see that injury necessarily on the other plants that are here. So Dr. Becky Bolin, would you explain a little bit what's a dicot, what's a monocot? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, I'm serious. Yeah, I mean, this yeah. A what dicot is, is two cots and a monocot is one cot. One cot. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, and, and a lot of times, like when we're talking about this from a weeds perspective, we may use the terms grassy versus broadleaf. Those waters get a little bit muddy because, you know, monocots can include a lot of different things. And, you know, uh, like these red yuccas that are not true yuccas, but they're, you know, in that asparagaceae family. And, and, you know, uh, also all of our camillinaceae plants tend to be monocots and they don't, at first glance, we may not think of those as grassy plants, right? When we're looking at a wandering traveler or a purple heart vine, but, you know, they're, they're you know, one cot versus two cot, cot standing for cotyledon um, and some distinctive features that we would see to distinguish between the two. Um, one of the most common is going to be the venation or the way that the veins are arranged on the leaf of the plant. For a monocot, we're going to typically see parallel or striped venation. For a dicot, we're going to see some kind of netted venation. There are actually exceptions to this, and I'm, I learned of a new one recently. So the rattlesnake master apparently is a dicot with parallel venation, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, we'll also see that monocots tend to have a more fibrous root system, whereas our dicots tend to have more of a taproot system. Uh, monocots have flower parts in multiples of three. Dicots have flower parts in multiples of four or five. And we have, you know, some herbicide groups. And the, the first one that comes to mind for me are the synthetic auxins. Mm -hmm. These are designed to mimic auxin. They're primarily used to control broadleaf or dicot plants. They include things like 2,4-D dicamba, which incidentally are also the products that we see associated most often with drift or volatilization injury. And so those products, we may not see symptoms of injury on a monocot the way that we might on a dicot. And so that would be like, my question is, is there a tree over here that I can't see? And what does that tree look like? Or is there another broadleaf nearby? So... <laughs> Well, thanks, uh, I, probably, I probably need to go out there and just take a look because you're right. You can't see everything around and you can't, you know, and it looks like you could get a snack while you're there. Just if yeah, I'm looking. I, I could, I think, <laughs> I think that's like a, a Chick-fil-A or a something there. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. And Robbie said that uh, the, the crape myrtles with uh, there being a, you know, with similar uh, damage that be, you know, crape myrtle plants are being uh, over sprayed with a roundup drift. And sometimes the uh, transplant root damage have a uh, latent response. And uh, well, you know, because uh, a lot of woody plants have a lot of reserves. So, uh, so uh, they may not show some symptoms right away. And, and the question is, are Chinese pistach more sensitive to herbicide? Um, that part, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I have uh, not uh, purposely uh, applied herbicide to, uh, to to a, a pistachio tree. Uh, 
Um, a Chinese pistache, uh, you know, looks to me, it's a pretty tough, it's a, it's a pretty tough, uh, tough tree. Um, think about it, 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 it came all the way from China, you know, uh, it must be tough. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I don't have, I mean, that was just a little, like, you know, whole, whole thing. So, so I appreciate all y'all's input, and I'll try to get out there and see what I can see. So, we're going to be waiting for the sequel, right? Yeah, the sequel, maybe. We're going to be maybe. waiting for the sequel of the uh, funky uh, Chinese pistache. Funky Chinese pistache, <laughs> part two. Okay. Part two, okay. And next, and next time, it will be accompanied by funky music. Yeah, maybe some music. Or something. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> need a DJ. <laughs> that can be arranged. Okay. All right. So I guess we're on to plan of the week. Yay. There we go. Paul, I think it's, uh, you're taking it away. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. So uh, this week's plan of the week, uh, and again, a Texas superstar is the Angelonia. Uh, specifically the Serena series, which is, which is uh, the one that's been recognized as a Texas superstar. Uh, these two images are from our trials that we've got this year uh, down on the southwest side of the county. Uh, this is uh, blue improved on the uh, left-hand side and purple improved on the right-hand side. Uh, they've got an Excellent habit. Uh, the, the one, the main thing with this series is they are from seed. Um, so it is for the producers, it's a lower input. Um, they produce, uh, they're very uniform, uh, not only within the colors, but across the colors, which is nice. Uh, their habit is somewhat mounding, uh, but I believe it, it, it gives you more of an upright look because of the way the flowers present themselves. Uh, this one, once it's in the landscape and established, um, down here, it blooms for us all summer uh, into October, probably even early November. Uh, and once established, it has low water needs. So, uh, you know, for you landscapers um, in, in some of those beds, especially if they are in full sun, the more sun, uh, the better off these plants are. Uh, even some afternoon shade, I, I've noticed the flower production is not as good on these um, as opposed to if they are sitting out there baking in the full sun. Landscape height uh, will top out um, about 20 inches. I've seen them get a little bit bigger uh, because of our growing conditions. You can use them in mass plantings, combination planters, uh, mixed borders. Nice color range. Uh, you've got blue, you've got purple, you've got rose, you've got white, and then they, they'll go ahead and mix those uh, and, and have like a watercolors uh, uh, offering. So um, this is genetics out of Pan American Seed. Um, once you, if you are a producer and you buy in these plugs, uh, there is no pinching required. And usually it is recommended a, uh, especially for down here would be a uh, Paclobutrazol application about two weeks after transplant. Uh, and that's it. So very low inputs, not much in the way of PGRs, one drench and, and you'd be good to go. Uh, and on a production side, ideally, it's either packs, quarts, and probably largest would be about a gallon. Uh, I wouldn't go much, much larger than that on its own. Um, there is a sister series to this, uh, the Serenas. There's the Serenitas, which are a little bit smaller, a little bit more compact, and they play off of each other really well. So uh, if you need something a little bit smaller, maybe in the front of the bed, this is probably more in the, uh, the mid midsection of the bed, depending on the size of the bed further back. But if you want something in front, the Serenitas are going to give you the same look, uh, the same response, and uh, they perform ex just as well as the Serenas. So that is it for the plan of the week. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. We, yeah. So we at 1250 right now. We got a few more minutes to go around. Uh, but before we can move on, you know, I want to just jump back to that moth thing. Um, and, and talk to you a little bit about mimics. A um, couple of things uh, that you, you might want to realize is oftentimes that webbing and the uh, moth poop um, has been mistaken as uh, sclerotinia or snow blight on ornamentals. Um, and, and that's a real simple way to test for it, whether it's a, 
you know, whether it's fresh or it's a, it's a, a sclerotia. Um, uh, the answer is do not taste it, but at least you can squeeze it on your fingernails. And if it flattens out real nicely, that's poop. And if it doesn't and, and feels more hard, that's a sclerotia. That's a simple way to, to, to test between those two if you can't find the caterpillar. Anyway, uh, we got maybe about, what, 15 more minutes or so of time. So it's open time. If you got a question, put it in the chat. Um, if I make an observation on the, on the Dufa moth, I, I, I'll be happy to. Yes, go ahead, Carlos. Please do. Carlos yeah. is an insect dude, too. So, yes, please do. Yeah, I was I was uh, I was still in extension when when we first uh, saw it in in, uh, in in Texas, and I I first heard about it from a from a poinsettia grower in, in East Texas, and it was in the fall of two thousand and ten. Uh, huh. And and uh, it 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 seemed that that greenhouse got some material directly from California, and they suspect that that's how they got it. So at that point. We did not think it was established still in Texas, but but that's when I first was aware of it. Uh, I was also going to mention, like like uh, uh, Kevin did, the, the symptoms, you know that uh, that uh, wilting, uh, uh, you know, and then some webbing looking thing could also be a, a plant pathogen. So uh, uh, watch out for that. But he already he already mentioned that. Uh, yeah, the the. The, the challenge with this, with this uh, pest is where they feed and that they are protected. Uh, that a silk, they, they produce this silk and they cover themselves with the, with the plant material, the, the, the peat, the, the, wh whatever they have, their uh, residue. And so a, 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 a direct spray with contact insecticides oftentimes does not do the, the, the trick. Uh, but uh, like Irfan mentioned, there are, there are several products that are specific to, to caterpillars that are, that are very safe and, and very compatible. Uh, uh, but the challenge is to get, uh, to get uh, the contact at the right time before the damage occurs. One product that, that I used to recommend or suggest uh, is something called Intrepid 2F. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's by Dow. Uh, um, and, and now we also have uh, Sarisa. Uh, those two products are 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 uh, provide the residual control that you may may need to control the to prevent the damage on, on at the base of the stems. It has been a, an issue. First, it was only a greenhouses, but but now uh, uh, some some nurseries, like you mentioned, in the in, in the mums, but in the southeast, uh, is is a, is attacking things like a laurel petalum. Which, which I wouldn't think, you know, I, th I thought they would stay, uh, stick to more herbaceous plant material, but they're also going, going for witty, I mean, woody material. As long as it's got contact with the soil surface, they, they, they love to girdle and, and to feed on that cortex uh, when it's uh, very close to the ground because they can protect themselves again with that, with that silk. So uh, um, it, is, it has become more of an issue, not only in Texas, but also in the Southeast. Florida, uh, um, uh, you know, they detected about the same time we did, but but it's on and off, and I, I think it's just the the overwintering thing. But 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 yeah, um, we still uh, don't know a lot about it because it's hard to rear, to to keep in colonies and and to do testing uh, uh, with control experiments. So we're still trying to learn, uh, like our fans said. So so uh, so the OHP is is willing to. To, to help with any 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 of any efforts in, in looking more into effectiveness of, of different options. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Hey, yeah. anyone with any comments more about moth? I don't have a comment about moth. I'm a plant person, so I'm going to make a comment about the uh, angelonia. <clears throat> The uh, the angelonia is 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 actually a very great crop and. Uh, uh, and, and as uh, Paul put there, it's also called a snap, summer snapdragon. And you'll probably know that uh, snapdragon is, uh, snapdragon is, snapdragon not, you know, snapdragon itself is a very uh, a popular uh, winter cut flower. And similar to the real, you know, cool season winter snapdragon, uh, angelonia, you know, uh, 
actually makes a pretty cut too. Um, I know that some of our uh, uh, cut flower producers, you know, especially cut flower producers are uh, exploring some of the, you know, just, just looking at the culture and also, you know, cultivar selections and stuff, looking at, you know, the possibilities of using summer snapdragon, that is angelonia in their uh, cut flower mixes. And of course, you know, the post harvest, uh, the, the vase life is not going to be as long as your, you know, roses, carnations, or mums, <clears throat> but um, they have seen uh, like seven to 10 days of, uh, of vase life. So that's, you know, that's actually pretty good for a, a local uh, small cut flower producers. So just have one simple uh, comment there about Angelonia. Paul, have yeah, you all... And yeah, I was going to say, and, and Mung Mung, there's a couple varieties out there that now these are vegetative, um, but the flowers are even larger. So I could see those fitting that, um, you know, those requirements uh, and the plants are taller also. Um, I, I have not come across any Angelonia that yet that have the, you know, like the, the growth habit of a typical, uh, you know, the snapdragon that we're used to with, with that, with those longer stems, but there are some that are getting up there that are a little bit, a little bit taller uh, and the flower is larger. So, um, you know, you, you get more for your money, you get more, you know, it'll, it'll provide a, a more of a pop as a, uh, as a cut flower. So I think the, the potential and the possibilities there. Uh, of course, you know, the, I mean, if you just look at the stems, the stems of the Angelonias is not going to be as, you know, some of the snapdragons could get, a, you know, like a, like a, a finger mm -hmm. thick uh, stem, you know, for Angelonias, you're not going to get that type. Uh, but with the uh, um, uh, snapdragons are often uh, just one stem, you know, you cut it and then uh, either you wait for it to branch out and that's going to take a long time or some just simply have like one cut and then uh, discard the, the rest. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's it for one crop. But for Angelonia, you know, definitely there, you're going to, you, you, you know, you, you definitely going to harvest uh, multiple uh, stems out of, out, out of this, you know, throughout the season. And yes, you're right. You know, it's, it's, you're, you're not going to get that uh, long stem. Uh, you know, you're not going to get that long, strong stem like the, uh, like the uh, snapdragon. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, some, some cultivars, like, like you said, the vegetative ones, uh, the spikes are definitely longer than the uh, some of the seed varieties. So, well, that's good information, and I think Becky actually has some cool stuff to share with you guys about new, of oh, I should say, progress in herbicides. So, Becky, you yeah. want to share your screen or something? Yes, I will do that. So, I just wanted to share something with you guys. I I, I don't um I haven't done any of my own research on this, but this was oops. But this was something that was shared with me this week that I thought was pretty interesting. So um, this was an announcement made by the EPA on September 9th, so not very long Yesterday. ago. Yesterday. Uh, and it basically talks about how the EPA is accepting comments on the proposed registration of two new products containing Pseudomonas fluorescence strain ACK55 as a new microbial active ingredient to be used as a pre-emergence herbicide. And it goes on to kind of talk about how specifically they think that this can be effective on uh, invasive grasses that have environmental consequences, including they contribute to wildflower, uh, wild fire susceptibility. Uh, they also contribute to greenhouse gas emission. Um, so I was just kind of, as, as you guys were talking, I was just picking through some of the literature to see what has been published to kind of uh, support some of this that's been done. A uh, little bit of a mixed uh, things there, but uh, I did find this article and uh, it is about uh, the use of this particular bacteria to selectively suppress annual bluegrass or poa annua. Um, so I just thought this was really interesting because, uh, you know, there, there are not a lot of uh, vetted biological control options for weeds right now, I would say. Uh, and the literature, the research um, kind of exploring that is more limited. So I thought this was kind of interesting because it, it shows me that there's some progress being made on that end. And we may have some new options from a biological con control standpoint uh, when it comes to weeds for the future. So I thought... Uh, I just thought that that was pretty neat. And I actually think I may be able to download this PDF and we can uh, find a way to share it with the group. I don't think it's open access, but I think- we Yeah, can. I don't think it's supposed to do that, Becky. Okay, sorry. I just thought it was neat. I can share the abstract at least. 
Yeah, yeah. You, you can do that, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but uh, and, and any of you can correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that uh, a, a biological herbicide was registered, I think, uh, for, I think, some researchers from Florida that actually utilizes a, a virus, one or two viruses. So uh, for you guys that, that, that are looking at this one, Pseudomonas fluorescens is a, is a bacterium. You used to work with them. It's, it's, when you talk about Pseudomonas fluorescens, it's called fluorescence because it actually glows in the dark. Um, and, and I was working at it, what, 25 years ago as a uh, beneficial um, microorganism. So it does produce certain uh, uh, microbial uh, chemicals that are antibiotic and, and it works against other, uh, um, other bacteria as well as other fungi. And so it's interesting to see they're starting to tap into the various strains of this uh, uh, microbe, of this bacteria to, for other purposes. You know, that's, that's what's cool about humans, able to use other things as um, tools. You know, everything from genetic engineering by using agrobacterium. If you all don't know what that is, think uh, crown gall on roses or those galls that are caused by bacterium. People use that now a as a form to introduce a piece of gene into a plant. A technique called agrobacterium mediates transfer. Utilizing a microbe that was once a plant pathogen now as a genetic uh, modification tool. And so it's always interesting to see some of this uh, 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 technologies uh, being implemented and then uh, uh, moving into mainstream. So, I saw so that, that's, I yeah. saw that announcement too, Becky. Uh, uh, in, in fact, it, it caught my eye too. Uh, uh, and I, I, was, I was wondering, uh, uh, did you see where, you know, would, it, would this be kind of a golf course or, or a, or a field grown crops uh, situation because I see in the, in the golf course, they use so many other things yeah. to control fungal, fungal and bacteria that, that, you know, it sounds, it sounds, it sounds really nice, but you know, uh, I wonder. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, um, I got the impression just from the very brief, you know, description there that it almost looked like more of a range product than uh, just the yeah. discussion around uh, fires and things like that. But um, seems like it might open the door to a lot of good research and um, there's been some some interesting research that's being done lately kind of looking at how soil microbial ecology and the microorganisms in the soil actually um, reduce the efficacy of some of our herbicide products because they degrade those products when we don't intend for them to and so we're starting to see that that relationship is a lot more complex and, and there's a lot of work kind of looking at that uh, right now as well so um, yeah, interesting. So that, that's a great area. In fact, uh, department, the Department of Plant Pathology and Microbiology, one of our new hires was actually working on what we call phytobiomes. So these are microbial populations in the soil and within the plants because the, the trend in biology now is understanding that it is a community that affects how a plant might react in this world or how a pathogen might react with the plant in the midst of all these other microbes. So the, the, the trend would be towards looking at potential avenues of manipulating the population or so to create environments that might be conducive uh, for the plants to make it less susceptible to diseases or, or, or basically increase its ability to absorb nutrients and, and all those good things uh, with the goal of trying to uh, develop plants that are healthy and that would benefit humans. Anyway, we got about five minutes more. Anything else, Dr. Gu, housekeeping stuff, perhaps you want to say anything else? Oh, Becky, do you have more stuff? I have one thing I wanted to say, which is that we are finalizing our survey and I want to make people aware of that here so that when they see that that is shared with them, they, they know what our intention is behind that and hopefully will help us by sharing some information with us. So 
that was one thing I wanted to talk about briefly is that we, we will um, be developing or we are developing and are almost uh, finished developing a survey to go along with our chat with Green 90s program where we just want to get feedback from you guys, the viewer, as to what's working for you, um, what are you gaining from this, and it just allows us to kind of really uh, look at, at how, how, what's working in the program and where we can improve. So, um, so I just wanted to give everybody a heads up for that. Thank you. Not to pull from that, but this is the proposed label for that Pseudomonas product when we're talking about where, um, where, where the potential use is. I don't see, I don't see like, um, say golf courses or, or general. Uh, if you're sharing the screen, you're sharing the wrong screen. Front. Oh, well, that's no good. Uh, here, let me switch over to this side. Do you see it now? Uh, it hasn't switched yet. Still Serena, Serena Agilonia. Oh, it must be. I'm sorry. It's just sharing the uh, the PowerPoint instead of my desktop here. Sorry. One moment. That's okay no, because uh, Serena. There we go. Do y'all see that now? Yeah, much less attractive, but yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this is the. I think the proposed label for uh, for that Pseudomonas product. Uh, sorry, I don't want to detract away from the, um, the, the, the survey, but I was just kind of researching as, as y'all were posing that question about where uh, they're proposing using this particular product. Okay. Wow. So it's got quite a range then. Yeah. I'll but nonetheless, think with the documents and, you know, possibility to comment uh, in the chat. But nonetheless, as, as Becky mentioned, this is a, you know, it's a good start to get to a place where uh, we may have opportunities to see more of those uh, 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 microbial antagonists, uh, uh, natural products uh, to be used uh, to benefit in, in terms of uh, landscape type management. Um, it starts with the rangelands, but you hope you know, it'll eventually get to turf fields, sod farms, and uh, uh, home gardens, or home lawns, and so on. So, great. We got a couple of minutes left. Let's see if there's anything else uh, uh, to remind you guys. Do want, want to say that, uh, that if you look at the chat, uh, Airfund did put, um, and, and, and also Becky did put uh, links to uh, several things. Uh, the most recent one is the, uh, uh, to the uh, docket where you, uh, you can put comments in regarding uh, the, uh, the uh, proposed label. This is one place that if you're a landscaper and you see a future or potential of this stuff in, in your area, it's not a bad idea to go just say, hey, you know, this is something that I would love to see in, in, uh, for use in, in, in uh, urban type landscape type situations. Um, but take a read at the label uh, just to get a gist of, of how it works and what it can do and, and some of the uh, uh, potential dangers that may be associated with it. Um, other than that, uh, next week, we will be meeting again at 12.12 on Thursday. Uh, and I don't know what's on tap for that, but show up because I bet you we'll always have something good. Um, and don't forget, I think, uh, I don't know when the plan is, but I suspect that, that uh, a survey will be going out uh, to you all soon. If you all can provide feedback to help us make this better, or even help us, you know, uh, share with your buddies who are in uh, the industry. If this is beneficial for, for y'all, please let them know. And if you have topic areas that you think might be beneficial to you as well as others and like to be brought up in this uh, uh, forum by one of us or several of us, do um, email it to uh, Dr. Goo or put it on Facebook. Um, we will entertain those type of requests. Um, if you have any other comments to make, you can put that in the chat. If not, we will see you next week. It's uh, 1.10 right now, and Kevin Ong is signing off for the rest of us. Thank you. Take care, all.